So here we are. Welcome to Equipping Hour. Uh, Come on in and find a seat. And we're going to pick up where we left off last week. And the the topic of the day uh, for the short series here is speaking for God. And let me pray and get us started this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather again. Uh, What a joy it is on a Sunday morning thinking again about an empty tomb resurrection, the conquering of death, and what that means for us and for the forgiveness of sin, that the son's sacrifice was acceptable to you. He was a sinless offering in the place of sinners, and his substitute sacrifice was worthy. It was acceptable payment for all of our crimes, for all of our sins. And an empty tomb means that that payment was accepted and that we are indeed free, free from the slavery of sin, free from the penalty due us for our sins. And one day we shall be free even from the very presence of it in our own hearts and in a world of corruption. Lord, we long for that day. In the meantime, I pray that we would be faithful ambassadors, bold, courageous proclaimers of good news to a world that desperately needs it. And we ask for help, even as we study what it means to speak for you uh, in this equipping hour. We ask for help in it in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, we're dealing with the very serious business of speaking for God. And we're trying to live in, in the tension between James 3.1 and Ephesians 4. James 3.1 says, Let not many of you become teachers, my brothers, for you will incur a stricter judgment. Speaking for God is serious business. It comes with serious accountability. And nobody should just haphazardly step into, thus saith the Lord. Don't let many of you become teachers. And yet Ephesians 4 makes it clear that as believers, we are one to another to speak truth in love in order that we might be built up. We proclaim truth to one another in songs and hymns and spiritual songs. And so... While I want us to be absolutely terrified of speaking for God, I also simultaneously want us to be bold and courageous to speak for God. And so if you uh, only hear half of what we say in this series, you'll, you'll miss out on the truth of Scripture. We are to fear the Lord and fear misrepresenting Him, and we are to fearlessly proclaim His truth in the world. And that's true for teachers and preachers. It's Also true for every single believer as an ambassador of the gospel. We represent the king. So let's jump back in to this critical topic. I want to pick up where we left off at the end of last week and thinking through the consequences of misrepresenting God. We we listed these last week. We're going to dig in a little bit more deeply this morning. And one consequence of misrepresenting God is the result that we live by falsehood. We live by falsehood. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 23. And we'll look beginning at verse 16. We know that God's words are truth and they are life. They are the source of life for us. They are the solid rock upon which we can build our lives And other things are shifting sands, powerless, lifeless, errant. And there's a fundamental contrast between God's words, God's authority, the truth that comes from God, and every other competing voice. And if we choose to live by falsehood, the result is futility. Listen to Jeremiah 23, 16. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, or Yahweh of armies, do not listen to the words of the prophets who are prophesying to you. They are leading you into futility. They speak a vision of their own imagination, not from the mouth of the Lord. What is the result of of living by falsehood? It is futility. It comes not from God, it comes from the imaginations of men. A second consequence uh, of listening to false teaching or of being a perpetrator of false teaching and mis- misrepresenting God is that real problems of life go unaddressed. The real problems of life go unaddressed. Look at the next verse in Jeremiah twenty-three seventeen. 
They keep saying to those who despise me, that is, the false prophets, keep saying to people who don't love the Lord, Yahweh has said, you will have peace. And as for everyone who walks in the stubbornness of his own heart, they, the false prophets, say, calamity will not come upon you. This is the I'm okay, you're okay, we're all good message from those who claim to represent God but do not. And so the real problems of life get unaddressed. The problem in Jeremiah 23 was that the people despised the Lord. That is a fundamental heart problem that needs serious addressing. And the false prophets painted over that, whitewashed over that fundamental heart problem and said, no, 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 it's all good, you're okay. There's nothing you need to address. The problem was they're despising the Lord. The problem was, Jeremiah says, the stubbornness of their hearts. And the false prophet said, no, there's peace. You have peace. So sin goes unaddressed. Sin may even be endorsed by the false teaching. And then a third consequence of misrepresenting God, not only, not only do we live by falsehood leading to futility but, and real problems go unaddressed, but thirdly, the truth itself is discredited. Anytime a false prophet speaks and what the false prophet said does not come to pass, who's going to listen to somebody claiming to speak for the Lord again? And you understand that anybody who says, thus saith the Lord, gets lumped in to the group of people who said, thus saith the Lord, when the Lord thus not saith. And this was true of the Millerite controversy. The, the Millerites were those who uh, proclaimed the advent of the Lord or, or the, the coming of the Lord. And the Millerites, uh, William Miller in particular, prophesied that G the Lord Jesus Christ would return to the earth in 1834, 1833 or 1834, sometime in a one-year span. And, and when Jesus did not return uh, in October of 1834, uh, it was known uh, across the, the religious world as the Great Disappointment. And most of the, the Millerite phenomenon disappeared. People went back into various denominations. Many of them became shakers. Uh, some perpetuated Millerite doctrine and became, uh, they, they held on to Sabbatarianism, uh, that is a belief in a, a keeping of the Sabbath, but on the seventh day, they became known as the Seventh Day Adventists. And so some of that doctrine perpetuated. But for the most part, it, it created a, a, a Vast disappointment across the evangelical world. This was the tail end of the Second Great Awakening. And then people shied away from any kind of adherence, any kind of listening to teaching that involved the future from Scripture. And so true things from the Bible about uh, a futuristic prophetic nature become discredited because a guy went outside the, the realm of Scripture and set dates for the return of Christ. Even to this day, proponents of premillennialism or those who would say there's a future reign of Christ coming to the earth, we take the, the promises to Israel literally, the promises of Christ's return at face value, even that, that biblical doctrine gets discredited under the banner of, well, yeah, the Millerites set dates in the 1830s. And what a tragedy that the truth itself is sacrificed on the altar of some guy wanting to make a name for himself and claiming to speak for the Lord when the Lord didn't speak. And you and I have to be very careful when we think about representing the Lord. If we misrepresent him, this is like the boy who cries wolf, eventually claims to speak for the Lord will not be heeded, they will not be listened to. This requires a lot of self-control on the part of teachers, preachers, uh, evangelists, missionaries, it requires self-control on the part of every single believer. If we are to speak truth one to another in love and so build one another up in the body of Christ, the church, then we need to make sure that when we are seeking to represent God's truth, it, it is what God's word says. Uh, to do otherwise is to discredit the real truth. A uh, fourth consequence is that uh, misrepresenting God actually leads people away from God's word. Anytime somebody comes out and says, I've got a new revelation from the Lord, or I'm trusting in my own uh, impressions, mystical impressions of the Lord's leading, uh, somebody says, the, the, the Lord has given a word to me for you, the, the effect of all of that 
is a moving away from the written word of God. Why? Because it's much easier to lean on an impression. It's much easier to sit down and and just listen to some guy speak and claim to speak for God than to do the hard work of studying the scriptures for myself. Listen, it, it's, it is hard work to open my Bible and to read it. And for some people, it's hard work because you have to learn to read. Think about the people in Papua New Guinea. How will they access God's word for themselves? Uh, Zach Can and Cassidy Can had to invent an alphabet and create a language and create a dictionary and then teach people to read and write their own language so that they can begin to access God's written word. Now, all of us in this room have benefited from an educational system that gives us the benefits of learning how to read. Have you ever thought about the great gift from the Lord that that is? Simply so that you may have access to his inscripturated revelation. And think about what that is. The written word of God is encapsulated in words that do not change. That means the the meaning isn't flexible. It's not a reader response theory that, well, it just means what it means to me. We, we all get together and pull ignorance and, and make the words mean something other than what they mean. No, we actually are dependent on what God meant by what he said, and that meaning never changes. That's why he put it in words. Not an impression that loses its meaning in telephone game. Uh, not some sort of mythology that is to be handed down by oral tradition. But God inscripturated his revelation so that it is fixed. This is really critical for us to understand. Anytime someone has an additional word from the Lord, an additional revelation, additional pronouncements, proclamations that they're receiving in some inside track outside of the Bible, the tendency is always to go to the additional revelation and leave the Bible in the dust. And then a fifth consequence of misrepresenting God is such invokes the ire of God. Look down again at Jeremiah 23. When you think about your own words, do you like to be misrepresented? When you say something and somebody takes your words, attaches your name to them, but then changes their meaning, do you appreciate it? (laughs) I remember as a kid uh, being interviewed by the Uh, Eagle River local newspaper because December 24th, which in Alaska was normally very snowy, we hadn't got a, hadn't a single inch of snow by Christmas Eve and my friends and I were out playing football in the front yard with, you know, dead grass and no snow. It was a huge disappointment to a kid. And the newspaper reporter saw us out there, came and interviewed us and uh, put our words in the local paper. They got every single statement wrong. I was so offended as a kid, I thought, I thought, this is the news, the height of objective reporting. They didn't get a single thing I said right, and I took little tiny offense at the misrepresentation. How much more should, God, should we expect that God would be offended at his words being misrepresented? Look at verse 17. They keep saying to those who despise me, Yahweh said you'll have peace. They walk in the stubbornness of their own heart and they say, calamity will not come upon you. But who has stood in the counsel of Yahweh that he should see and hear his word? Who has given heed to his word and listened? Behold, the storm of Yahweh has gone forth in wrath, even a whirling tempest. It will swirl down on the head of the wicked. The anger of Yahweh will not turn back until he has performed and carried out the purposes of his heart. In the last days, you will clearly understand it. I did not send these prophets, but they ran. I did not speak to them, but they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, then they would have announced my words to my people and would have turned them back from their evil way and from the evil of their deeds. Just understand, God does not like his words being misrepresented. And we need to keep that in mind. Now, before we jump into a series of Old Testament prophets relating to false prophecy, I want to give one significant caveat, and this is a caveat on providence. And by providence, we mean God is sovereign over all things. He is orchestrating all of history in its minutia. He orchestrates every detail of human history. It is his story. 
but we're not going to confuse providence with revelation. Okay, so I want you to turn to Ezra 1.5. I want you to see an example of where God's providence intersects with human experience. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms. So it's, it's back there. Page 486 in mine. Okay, listen to Ezra 1.5. The heads of fathers' households of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites arose, even everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up and rebuild the house of Yahweh, which is in Jerusalem. This is a fascinating text. God stirred up the hearts of his people to go back and rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild specifically the temple in Jerusalem, uh, the house of the Lord. Now, this stirring up the heart to go do something is not the same as God told me. This is not uh, direct revelation But this is God's intervention in history, even his intersection with human experience. And the men involved in this um, would not be saying, God told me to go build the wall. They could just as well be saying, I wanna go go rebuild the house. I wanna go back to Jerusalem. Now the narrator who is divinely inspired here, is giving us the account of the behind the scenes of what God is doing. Why did all these people simultaneously want to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the house? Because God stirred their hearts. God gave them a desire to do so. Can God give people a desire to obey him? Well, yes. That's his providential care for his people. If you find yourself desiring to do something, and you look back and you say, wow, look, look what God did. It's appropriate to give God credit for his providential hand in history. We just need to be careful that we're not thinking about God's providence like a divining rod. You know what a divining rod is? You know, a Y-shaped stick that some guy goes out in the field and looks for water. Where's the water? Doing. You've never done that? You've never found a well in your backyard with a divining rod. Um, Finding God's will, finding God's revelation, finding God's word in a circumstance like this is not looking for some voice to tell me what to do, but I have this desire. Other people have this desire. We'll find out the circumstances in a moment. And we can look back and say, wow, God moved all of us to go do this. And you can look back sort of in a rear view mirror and give credit where credit is due in God's providential dealings with mankind. That is different than looking to my internal impressions as direct revelation on a par with the word of God. Now, um, we know that God can move thoughts. We know that God can move wills to bring about his sovereign plan. Uh, You know, the heart of a king is in the hand of God like channels of water, and God makes it go where he wishes. You remember the story in Genesis 20 of Abimelech and Abraham. Abimelech, a pagan king, desired not to touch Sarah, Abram's wife. And God came to him in a dream and said, I didn't let you touch her. Now, Abimelech didn't feel like a robot. He wasn't some automaton as as a slave to some uh, uh, unknowable force making him do contrary to what he wanted to do. He did what he wanted to do and God was sovereign. God was steering the course of history even through the desire of a pagan king. Of course God can do these things. This is in the realm of providence. As the sovereign orchestrator of all events, he does this every day. What I want you to notice in Ezra 1.5 is that the inspired narrator identifies for us, the readers, that God stirred up the hearts. Notice, secondly, that it does not indicate that the the, the builders felt the providential stirring. Nothing in the text indicates that they felt something. Thirdly, notice that God was arranging not only their desires, but also the activities of the kings of the pagan nations. Look back up at verse 1. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of Yahweh by the mouth of Jeremiah, 
Yahweh stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he set a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and he put it into writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, Yahweh, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of Yahweh, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Every survivor at whatever place he may live, let the men of that place support him with silver and gold, goods and cattle, together with the free will offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. Verse 5, then the heads of father's households arose, everyone whose spirit God stirred. So now you understand the, the situation and the setting. There's this proclamation from the king of the foreign nation of Persia who invites the people from uh, Judah and Benjamin to go back and rebuild. And they decided to do that. They, they could look at that circumstance and say, hey, did you, did you see what the king said in the news? Okay, and he's providing materials. Wow, this is great. Let's go. You want to go? And what does the narrator say by divine inspiration? God stirred their hearts. And so you have this symbiotic relationship, the, the, these compatible ideas that a man does what he wants to do and God is sovereign over those desires and the consequent actions. This is a biblical category we have to have, that um, God is providentially caring for the world in all of its details. We are never instructed in Scripture to look for or to follow promptings, uh, like an internal subjective prompting. We do know that as a man plans his steps, Yahweh directs his path, and for that we can be thankful. Uh, navigating life in this world is difficult. It, it, it's difficult to just follow clear commands of Scripture. It's challenging to learn to apply biblical principles and wisdom. And then there's a whole spectrum of things uh, that are outside the category of commands or biblical principles that are just, I don't know, blue shirt, red shirt. Which one do I want to get out of the closet and put on today? And I'm going to plan my steps. And as I'm planning my steps, God, direct my path. That's appropriate. And we're not looking for direct revelation. We're not looking for God in a booming voice to answer, blue shirt. <laughs> but we're going to make choices based on biblical commands, biblical principles, and then our own desires, which are being sanctified by the word of God. You know, if, if you're uh, harboring sin, just know that your decision-making is gonna be polluted. But when you're tracking with the Lord, and seeking to apply biblical wisdom to life situations, confining yourself to the application of biblical principles, and following biblical commands, there is a, a freedom to plan your steps. And know this, the Lord is faithful to direct your steps. That is liberating. And we ought to give thanks to God for this. God's sovereignty extends over the desires and thoughts of all of us, his creatures. We should not be dis, uh, surprised at all that he would direct the course of events through such providence. This is categorically different than revelation. Revelation must always be true. Remember Titus, two, Titus 1, 2, we looked at last week. God cannot lie. Therefore, his revelation is in keeping with his character. God's revelation is also verifiable, and God's revelation demands obedience. Listen, wherever God has spoken, we must heed. That's different than making a choice in the realm of our freedom uh, to make choices within preference things. Let me give you some takeaways just on this area of providence. If you experience a desire... And that desire is for something good. It's not sin. It doesn't violate biblical commands or principles. And you want to. You can. You can. To follow or to not follow such a desire is not an issue of obedience or disobedience. I have a really strong desire to go start some enterprise that's going to help people. What happens if you don't follow through on that desire? Were you disobedient to the Lord? No, that, that, des that desire is not a matter of revelation from the Lord and therefore is not subject to categories of obedience and disobedience. 
remember that you and I cannot discern the source of our desires. Remember the prohibitions we looked at last week about trusting our own hearts. And your heart is that conglomeration of thoughts, emotions, and will that make up our internal command and control center. Providence, personal preferences, sin are all mixed in there, in the heart. We don't know if if God's providence is directing this. Uh, We don't know if um, our our sinful inclinations mixed in are affecting the, the desires that we have. It could be indigestion. Maybe you had bad pizza and went to sleep. Um, You and I cannot discern why we think, why we feel, or or why we are moved in our motives to do certain things. Lack of sleep has profound effects on how you feel and what you choose to do. Dehydration, poor nutrition, some underlying medical condition. Maybe your thyroid is off-kilter. Listen, our physicality and our thoughts are probably more intertwined than we give them credit for. Not to mention our perception and decision-making are often profoundly affected by the consequences of our patterns of thinking and our previous decision-making. To assume that some prompting, some impulse, some feeling that just comes to me is the voice of the Lord in some direct communication, all of that is experimentally flawed because we are profoundly affected by so many other forces, internal and external. It's also an unbiblical notion. So again, if you experience a desire, and it's a good desire, not for sin, it doesn't violate biblical commands or principles, and you want to, you can. If you neglect to share the gospel, however, when you experience a strong desire to share the gospel and you know that you neglected it because of fear, well, there's sin mixed in there. (laughs) Put to death sinful fear. And then you can share the gospel or not share the gospel in any given circumstance. To refrain from sharing the gospel because there's sinful things going on in my heart means I need to repent of those sinful things. If you wake up at two o'clock in the morning with a strong desire to pray for someone, my recommendation is that you pray for that person. You may find out later that at that precise time, they were experiencing some emergency. And then you can look back and praise God for his providence. Is that direct revelation? No. But it is the realm of God's providence where he orchestrates all details, including the actions, the thoughts, the wills of his creatures. If you feel like praying for somebody, if you have a strong desire to share the gospel with somebody, if if you feel an impulse to serve somebody, to give or to meet some pressing need, just do it. Not as a matter of obedience, disobedience. But who knows what God is providentially orchestrating? Those are good things to do. You may find that your desires and someone else's circumstances are at God's intersection with eternal consequences. That's not the same as direct revelation. And before we get into biblical warnings about false revelation, I just wanted to clear the deck on providence and our subjective desires. What have we learned so far? We don't trust ourselves, and we trust that God is sovereign. That's a tremendous comfort. A man plans his steps, and the Lord directs his path. Let's define prophecy for just a moment. Prophecy is different than impressions or stirrings or subjective promptings. Prophecy is always direct revelation from God through a human mouthpiece. That is, the human hears from God and then must speak exactly as God has spoken. He he cannot waver. He cannot add. He cannot take away. He must be an accurate mouthpiece for God, or he is no prophet. And prophecy comes in two broad categories. There is the kind of prophecy that tells the future, and there's the kind of prophecy that tells the truth. Uh, We would call the one predictive prophecy. That's the kind that tells the future. Many prophets were given uh, predictive prophecy about things that would either in the near term or in the last days come to pass. 
But then many of the prophets, the speaking prophets in the Old Testament and also the writing prophets, many of them were given accurate assessments from God on present situations or they were given theological truth or declarations from God. That is still considered prophecy. It is direct revelation even though it doesn't tell the future. So we have foretelling and forthtelling, as some have called it. By the way, I do not believe that prophecy is the right word for preaching. Uh, That has been kind of a hallmark of the Reformation to equate preaching with prophecy. I believe that is an error. Uh, Some of my own preaching heroes have referred to preaching as prophecy, uh, as forthtelling. Hey, you're you're telling forth God's truth, therefore it is prophetic. Sometimes we we, we talk about people speaking prophetically because they're forthtelling God's truth, they're heralding God's truth. Uh, There are words in the Bible for that heralding, preaching, proclaiming, uh, gospelizing, uh, but none of those are prophecy. In fact, one of my favorite books on preaching is actually titled The Art of Prophesying. I think that's unhelpful. It's a really good book. It just changed the title. It's The Art of Preaching. You see, prophecy is always inerrant. Sermons are not. Preaching is authoritative as far as it comports with the truth of God's word. Equipping our messages are not inerrant, but God's word always is. Direct revelation always is. Prophecy is direct revelation from God through a human mouthpiece. The human hears from God and the human must speak exactly as God has spoken. Now let's look at some passages dealing with false prophecy and the specious claims of direct revelation. Turn to the book of Deuteronomy and chapter 13. Look at verse one. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder. And the sign or the wonder comes true, concerning which he spoke to you, saying, let us go after other gods whom you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for Yahweh your God is testing you to find out if you love Yahweh your God with all your heart, with all your soul. You shall follow Yahweh your God and fear him. You shall keep his commandments, listen to his voice, serve him, and cling to him. This is a really important text for us to understand. It begins with the notion that sometimes a false prophet gets a prediction right. False prophets are not believable if everything they say is not true. Nobody would listen if they were 100% wrong all the time. A lie is more believable if couched amongst truth. And sometimes even predictive prophecy can be accurate on the lips of a false prophet. Now, you'll know a false prophet because if he makes an error one time, he's a false prophet. But what if he gets it right sometimes? Uh, Let me give you a few explanations for why a false prophet can get a prediction right. First explanation, blind luck. You you make a prediction, uh, they're like a roulette game, there is some chance that what you said will happen might just happen. Another possibility is one who makes astute observations, a, a student of history, a student of patterns, a student of behavior, Uh, can make a prediction that may well come true based on what has happened before. Sometimes a prophet, uh, someone speaking for the Lord so-called, makes a prediction that is so abstract, so nonspecific, such that any circumstance could be seen as a fulfillment. Uh, Just to watch the the headlines of Christianity, uh, of the Christian world during COVID, when a lot of the people claiming to speak for God, a lot of the TV prophets and TV preachers were making predictions. And it was laughable how wrong they were. And, And you would think you would play it safe for uh, to lose your credibility would mean you would lose your followers. They didn't, they didn't lose credibility somehow, they didn't lose their followers. But most of the time, those TV prophets make abstract predictions that could be fulfilled by almost any circumstance. 
A fourth explanation is just that of a stopped watch. Right? A, a stopped watch isn't doing anything. I know we live in the era of smart watches. Okay, if you remember back to the old days when dials went around, if, if the battery died or the, the, it wasn't wound up enough and the, the, the dials just stopped, during a 24-hour day, how often would the watch be accurate? Precisely twice. And a false prophet, like a stopped watch, could be right twice a day. You've heard it said, a blind squirrel finds a nut in the forest. A lot of nuts in the forest, and a blind squirrel can find one. False prophets can do that. It could be more insidious. A false prophet could be adept at sleight of hand or manipulation, uh, some sort of conniving tricks to make people believe that he said something in the past and then it came to pass. And you see the hucksters who have gotten secret information uh, from people that come in the, in the doors of an assembly and, and they acquire this information about people and then they call out from up front that very information that they got on headphones from people in the back. Now that's, that's more manipulative. That's more insidious and conniving. It's, it's the use of technology to make people believe that the prophet knows something he otherwise would not have access to information. And then the last category is simply the demonic. Satan parades as an angel of light. Satan and his forces are involved in churches. Masters of deception. They've been around a lot longer than we have. They're good at their jobs. I don't mean good in a moral sense. I mean they know what they're doing and they're deceivers. Deuteronomy 13 gives us a test. And the test, according to verse Two is the test not of whether their predictions were accurate. Verse 1 gives us the category of, hey, a false prophet gave an accurate prediction. But if that false prophet giving an accurate prediction tells you to go after other gods, do not listen to him. But what is the test here in Deuteronomy 13? Um, if it is doctrinally or morally not in conformity with God's revealed will. This, let us go after other gods, is clearly discrediting, even if the stopped watch got the time right. Sometimes the false message is accompanied by compelling signs or wonders. I have an Assemblies of God background in my own life. And I was moved by the miraculous, or what appeared to be miraculous, being slain in the spirit and, and seeing friends healed, leg lengthenings and things like that. And by the, the approach of this apparent miraculous activity, I actually believed what was contrary to Scripture. My senses were informed, what I could see, what I could feel, what, what, what I could observe. My experience was real. Nobody could have talked me out of it, although my experience was manipulated. Nobody could have denied my experience. It was my experience. It was my subjective impression of, of what was happening around me. You couldn't have talked me out of it. But the information coming from the one who spoke for God was inaccurate. And the consequence of it for me was it took me a long time to undo theological error that I picked up over the course of a weekend. It took years to undo. And turn to Deuteronomy 18. In verse 20, the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. You may say in your heart, how will we know the word which Yahweh has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of Yahweh, if the thing does not come about or come true, that is the thing which Yahweh has not spoken. The prophet has spoken presumptuously, presumptuously, you shall not be afraid of him. Listen, there's some things to learn here. The first is the audacious reality that people actually do what this verse describes. There will be those who come in the name of Yahweh and say, God said, 
when God didn't say. This warning is here because people actually do this. They have the nerve to do this. I have had the nerve to do this very thing. But notice, not everyone who says God told me is speaking the truth. And there are various categories of this. Some do this uh, with sincerity. I, I believe there are people who love the Lord, who speak presumptuously, who speak beyond their knowledge, their awareness, areas they need to grow. There, there can be a sincerity of love for the Lord, a longing for a relationship with the Lord, and a confusion over Two-way communication equals relationship. I know I have a relationship with the Lord because he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. Did I just start singing that old hymn? <laughs> I used to love that song. I, we don't sing it here. <laughs> yeah, but there's a confusion over, man, what makes a relationship is the give and take of, of my Bible's closed and God and me are just talking with each other. That is not how God communicates. And so that would be the sincere brand of the presumption. But then there are the others that are the intentional charlatans. The ones who say, I can get people to give me money, to give me power, prestige, fame, and honor. I can garner a listening and a following after myself if I tell people I'm hearing from God and they need to listen to me. That is, a, that is a wicked enterprise. God calls it presumption. Clearly here in Deuteronomy 18, these are speaking, um, and God did not command them. What is to be the consequence? The death penalty, according to Deuteronomy 18. And notice that speaking for God presumptually, speaking for the one true God, is on a level with speaking for other gods. Look at verse 20 again. The prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in, my, presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that person shall die. Do you see, this is not some innocent foible, speaking for God when God hasn't spoken, and claiming to speak for Chemosh, or Baal, or Ashtoreth. It's all on a level and all requiring the death penalty under Mosaic law. What is the test in Deuteronomy 18? Any prophet that speaks something that does not come true is immediately to be identified as a false prophet and worthy of death. And notice the last phrase in verse 22, you shall not be afraid of him. Listen, there is a listener's responsibility (laughs) to have discernment to test the spirits, to cross-check the prophets. Turn to Isaiah chapter 8. And look down at verse 19. When they say to you, Consult the mediums and the spiritists who whisper and mutter. Should not a people consult their God? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. This is an important passage. There there will always be spiritual people who whisper and mutter. Uh, people that, that, that get your ear and, and talk in, in confusing ambiguities and, and claim a direct line to spiritual realities. That is opposite the clarity and publicity of God's word. God's word is to be spoken, proclaimed, out loud, in the open, with clarity. God's own word has clarity and it is to be publicized. Not around dark corners with somebody claiming some special link to the spiritual. And what should God's people do? You should consult God. Don't look for the mediums, the spiritists, the the tarot card readers, the horoscope writers. Don't consult the dead. Consult God. Listen, it is not an insult to God that we cross-check those who claim to speak for him. 
You remember Paul's experience with the Bereans in Acts 17. Um, They opened their Old Testaments, the only Bible they had at the time, to check whether the things that Paul was saying were true. And what's the remedy here in Isaiah 8? To the law and to the testimony, to the written revelation of God. And how much more in our day, even than Isaiah's, can we cross-check those who make claims for revelation against God's written word? Turn to Jeremiah chapter 5. I'm going to invite you to come back this evening to the evening service at 6 p.m. Bobby Casillas will be teaching the entire book of Jeremiah so that after I make these comments, you can get the whole context. Jeremiah 5, verse 30. An appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule on their own authority, and my people love it so. What is God's assessment of false prophecy? It is appalling and horrible. And then he goes on to say the the priests, those whose job it was to be intermediaries for God and the people, they actually ruled God's people on their own authority. And listen, leaders of God's people are to lead with authority, but not with their own. It is always derived and it is accountable. Someone who claims to speak for God is invoking God's name to support their own authority, their own own desires, their own power, and to get God's people to submit to a human false authority. But notice what Jeremiah says. God's people loved it that way. Why do you think that is? We've already talked about the fact that believing in falsehood leads to futility nothingness, everything frustrated. Why do people listen to false prophets? Why do people listen to false teaching? We will see this again and again in our study, but ear-tickling messages that leave sinful tendencies unchecked, that leave the flesh unabated, will always be popular. The proclamation of peace and goodwill while you remain a slave to sin That is a pleasing message to a captive audience. Jeremiah 6, verse 13. For from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for gain. And from the prophet, even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. They have healed the brokenness of my people superficially, saying, peace, peace, but there is no peace. Notice the motive of the proclaimers and the audience here in Jeremiah 6. It's greed. And those who proclaim falsehoods can be motivated by greed to do so, but those who listen to falsehoods can also be motivated by greed. I think this is the fundamental flaw of the health and wealth gospel of American evangelicalism. The the proclaimers and the audience motivated by greed. They want happiness, not holiness. They want a, a better life now. They, they, they hear the promises of the false teacher and they think, yeah, that's what I want. It's an easy message to listen to because it does not indict our sinful hearts. And notice what God says about it through Jeremiah. Everyone involved is dealing falsely. And then he describes in verse 14 the healing superficially. They have healed the brokenness of my people superficially. People are feeling bad. They're feeling glum. They're feeling down. And the false prophet comes and says, I'm okay. You're okay. God gives peace. We're all good. That is a superficial healing. When I was in grad school, I played volleyball and I went head over heels over an aluminum bench on, on the side of a court, and it dug a nickel-sized chunk out of my shin. And uh, I still needed to play, so pulled my sock up, and it bled a little bit. Uh, went home, put Band-Aids on it. Uh, I was superficially 
healing a wound. It was no healing at all. Two weeks later, my entire leg swelled up so big, you couldn't see my knee or my ankle. It was gangrenous, and the medical professionals chewed me out. They were really upset. I'm glad my mom wasn't there. They said, I hope the amputation works or you're going to die. Uh, Is there something else we can do first? Second opinion, please. Well, we're going to pump you full of antibiotics, and we hope that works so that we don't have to cut off your leg. Thankfully, the antibiotics worked. Still have my, still have my leg. But my attempt at a, a bandage over a chunk of flesh carved out of my leg was a superficial healing. There really no healing at all. And for false teachers, false prophets, to look at, at people enslaved to their sin, greedy for their own appetites, and say, you're all good with God. Peace, peace, goodwill. It's no healing at all. It is no balm. It might make people feel good for a moment. But the results are catastrophic. Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Every Christmas time, we, we sort of have this sentiment, and, and the sentiment is borrowed from the King James Bible of Luke 2.14. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace and goodwill toward men. Have you heard that? Have you sung it? The, the message implied in, in that wording is Jesus came. That means God is happy with us, and all is at peace with us and with God. God just has goodwill towards humanity. That is not actually the text of Scripture there. It's a a bad translation in the King James. Here's the New American Standard of Luke 2.14. It's fundamentally different. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. (laughs) That's a totally different meaning. Sometimes this sentiment is expressed at the dismissal of church services with the, with the phrase, you are loved. Have you heard that? You're loved. Sort of this indiscriminate paintbrush to everybody in the room, assuring people that God's love is covering you. And now it is true that God loves the world of humanity. It, it, it's Proof is in the fact that he sends rain and sunshine on the godly and the ungodly alike. God's love even for his enemies is something we are to model. We are to love our enemies and therefore be like our Father in heaven who is perfect. And yet this idea, this statement that you are loved expressed as churchgoers leave a service is problematic if it leaves the unrepentant with the notion that they are in good standing with God. And we have to be careful with that. You see, there is no peace with God until there is justification. Romans 5.1 is clear. Having been justified by his grace, we have peace with God. We only possess peace with God after justification. Not until. Prior to justification, what do humans experience in a relationship with God? Enmity, the wrath of God abiding, the storing up wrath for the day of his judgment. Romans 2. There is no more criminally liable proclamation with eternal consequence than convincing an audience of hell-bound humans that they're on a good path and that everything is going to be okay. For a preacher or a pastor or a guru or a spiritual guide or an influencer to do so is the greatest dereliction of duty and the abuse of platform. The stakes are infinitely high and the consequences of that influence are eternal. Let's look at one more, Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 8. How can you say we are wise, and the law of Yahweh is with us? But behold, the lying pen of the scribes has made it into a lie. The wise men are put to shame. They are dismayed and caught. Behold, they have rejected the word of Yahweh. And what kind of wisdom do they have? Therefore, I will give their wives to others, their fields to new owners, because from the least even to the greatest, everyone is greedy for gain. From the prophet even to the priest, everyone practices deceit. They heal the brokenness of the daughter of my people superficially, saying, peace, peace, but there is no peace. Were they ashamed because of the abomination they had done? 
They certainly were not ashamed, and they did not even know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall. At the time of their punishment, they shall be brought down, says Yahweh. Notice in verse 18, or verse 8, these make the claim of wisdom. They make the claim of having God's word. The law of Yahweh is with us, they say. God's assessment, these are lies. God makes clear that their so-called wisdom will be exposed. And notice what he says in verse 9. They're put to shame, dismayed, and caught. What kind of wisdom are they left with? None. What are the consequences? Verse 10, the loss of everything precious, their wives, their fields. What was their motive? According to verse 10, everyone greedy for gain. There it is again, the motive of greed. To speak for God, to, to get what doesn't belong to me. In verse 11, we see a repeat of what we saw in Jeremiah 6. They heal superficially, saying, peace, peace, but there is no peace. And God says this is shameful abomination, verse 12, but they are not ashamed. Isn't that tragic when you cannot blush over that which is actually shameful? And the consequence in verse 12 is divine accountability. They will fall their punishment will be brought down. Listen, this is serious business. This morning section of this series is sobering. And once again, I don't want you to hear the half of it. The first half is be afraid to speak for God. Be afraid to put words in God's mouth he hasn't said. Be afraid to misrepresent him. And we do need to get to the second half, which is courageously, boldly, fearlessly speak God's truth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that we would do just that, that we would be wary of speaking where you have not spoken, but that we would be bold with all that you have said. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.